I want to bring in uh, Professor Burns now. Professor, you have been doing, I mentioned when I introduced uh, you, you've been doing some really interesting studies of dog brains, um, literally using the MRI, MRI scanning devices. And you discovered, you did an op-ed in the New York Times and basically said at the end of it that from what you can see of, of the brain activity of a dog, dogs, quote, are people too. What did you mean by that? Well, Meredith, um, it, it really never even started out that way. I mean, this whole project started um, about two years ago um, after one of my favorite dogs, a pug named Newton, passed away after 15 years. And all I wanted to do was, was understand what was going on in his head. Did he actually feel the same way that I did in kind of the dog version? Um, so. Yeah, I'm a neuroscientist, and so that's kind of what I know. So I teamed up with a dog trainer to see if we could train dogs to actually go in an MRI and see how their brains work, more to the point, how their brains work when they interact with us humans. And that's how it really started, and, and since it began, it's kind of become this citizen science project now which, where we have a dozen people and their dogs participating and and what we're finding is, is amazing, actually. Well, how, how do you even get a dog to go into one of those machines and, and sit still? Uh, with a lot of food and a lot of praise. But, but seriously, I mean, actually, it's not for most dogs. So one of the things that we learned early on is that not all dogs take that to that environment. So if, if anyone has had an MRI, they know what it's like. It's, it's not pleasant for people. Uh, they're coffin-like spaces, um, they're incredibly loud. So the, the, the tube-like thing doesn't really bother most of the dogs. Um, what does bother them is the noise. And these things are loud. So one of the things we did initially was actually we, we've kind of developed a, a test or a tryout process for dogs who want to participate. And we try to see how noise sensitive they are first. Because the whole thing has to be fun for them. We don't want to subject dogs to this this project who don't want to do it and who get yeah. anxious. So the first thing we do is we look for dogs who, who look like they'll do well in the environment. So we test them with the sounds from the scanner and then we kind of gradually increase it and get them used to it. And all the while kind of using positive reinforcement, food, praise. We actually make a game out of it. So we've built a simulator. So we have the dogs play in our simulator to get them used to the environment. It, it takes a couple of months. And then what have you discovered about dogs by, by studying them this way? Well, the amazing thing is, I mean, I think all the dog people out there already know or have feelings that their dogs love them. And, and certainly you don't need an MRI to prove this. And that's, that's not really what the project's about. The, the project is really about understanding how dogs do what they do and why is it that they're so amazing to us? You know, how is it? that their brains accomplish all these things um, that we kind of take for granted when we live with them. And what we're seeing is when the dogs are interacting with their humans, so we're actually scanning them, so they're actually in the scanner and their human is at the other end giving signals and interacting with them at the same time. So this is the key thing. When the dogs are interacting with their humans, we see strong activity in what we call the reward centers of their brain. And what's interesting about that is their reward centers look very much like the human reward centers under similar circumstances and kind of even structurally, these parts of the brain are pretty much in common between humans and most animals, in fact. And so from the beginning of the project, we were trying to determine how much of this is just due to food and shelter. So sometimes when I talk to, let's say, non-dog people, they kind of question this whole, this whole thing with the dog-human relationship, kind of convinced that it's, it's a scam on the dog's part, right? They just act cute and stuff to get food and shelter. So we're really trying to understand, is that true? Or is there something in there that looks kind of like human love, same things we experience? And, and in fact, that's what we are seeing. So I, I wonder what then, what does that say to you in terms of repercussions from this kind of a study? If in fact you're seeing that dogs um, respond in much the same way that people do, I think that raises a lot of questions about how we treat animals. Absolutely, and, and that's why I wrote that op-ed piece. And ever since that came out, um, I've had you know, this tremendous response from people on 
both ends of the spectrum. So it kind of ranges from, well, yeah, obviously dogs love us. You didn't need an MRI to figure that out to um, absolutely insane and, and kind of expanding the idea of animal rights and dog rights kind of means the end of Western civilization as, as we know it. Um, so you have to realize how the laws treat animals in this country. And in fact, most parts of the world, animals, dogs too, are legally property. They're property of the people who own them. I mean, that's how the law treats them. And although we have animal welfare laws, um, in my opinion, it's actually a fairly low bar. It means that you can't abuse animals. Um, and depending if you're in the farming industry, you kind of have to you know, kill them humanely, whatever that means. Um, but they're still property. And so what we're seeing is this kind of biological evidence for what I think a lot of people already feel, that there are processes going on in dogs and, and probably other animals, brands that look very much like ours, and maybe we should be reconsidering how we kind of treat animals or categorize them kind of in society as something more than property. I mean, I, I don't know about you, I look at my dogs as more than a piece of furniture, but that's how the law treats them. Well, you know, that's part why I, I the, when you talk about being an owner versus, I, I like the word guardian much better when I talk about my relationship with, with my pets, you know, as opposed to owning, again, it's that same notion of property right. and diminishes the animal. Right, right. And the issues are only really kind of come to bear when there's conflicts between animals or, or dogs and, and humans. I mean, in any kind of conflict between an animal and a human, the human kind of just by default, wins because you know a human's rights trump a piece of furniture. Um, but I think what we're seeing kind of suggests that maybe we should be looking at some consideration for the dogs. Kind of um, call it their pursuit of happiness. It's it's more than just kind of the avoidance of pain and suffering. I think there's a potential there that we need to recognize. And if you, you what would you like to see happen? Um, Best case scenario. Well, so best case, I mean, I mean, dogs are not people. I mean, you know, there is a difference. They don't have the capacity for language and kind of abstract thought that we do. But what I would like to see is kind of a creation of a category for, for dogs that is not furniture and has some kind of protected interests and rights under the law. I have a, a question, uh, Professor, here. Uh, why do you think humans have picked dogs as our best friends out of all other animals? That's a great question and I think frequently about that. Although I think maybe the better way to think about the question is why did dogs pick humans? Or really kind of whatever their ancestor was, some kind of dog-wolf hybrid. I mean nobody really knows what that animal was. And so the real question is why did they start living with us? And we don't know the answer to that. You know, some people think that it's because they helped early humans hunt, but I'm not convinced of that. I think the original reason why dogs and humans got together was fundamentally a social reason, that they liked each other's company. 